Okay, and the person who has been leading us um, wonderfully for the last two years, David Harrington. Thank you for your... Donna, thank you very much, and thank you for your extraordinary leadership as uh, chair of the board. Please, let's give Donna Wilson another round of applause. All right, so let the festivities begin. Uh, I'd like to bring up now our legislators. Um, Douglas J.J. Peters uh, is a dear, dear friend. Uh, uh, Doug and I served in both the legislature. <laughs> he said do that. Uh, Doug and I served on the county council together, uh, served in the legislature, legislature together. He is chair of the Senate delegation of Prince George's County, and he is also vice chair of capital budgets on the most influential committee on budget and tax. <laughs> Douglas J.J. Peters. <laughs> yeah, Next is um, the chair of our House delegation, Jay Walker. Uh, Jay and I actually, when I was in the Senate, uh, sponsored, we sponsored bills together. He is an uh, advocate of, of, for youth and health and business. Uh, he, was, he ascended to the chair of the delegation. And uh, my great affinity with Jay Walker is that he is a Howard University graduate. And um, go Bison. Uh, at, at that moment, you all needed to genuflect. Uh, when I say Howard. When I say Howard, you genuflect. Um, uh oh, what do you, oh, I heard that. Um, Jay also, as you might know, he is a uh, sportscaster on ESPN. Um, and, uh, and, and Jay, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is the it was played quarterback at Howard University, and is wow. is the uh, is the leading has the leading yards of any athlete that played on the Howard University football team. Mm -hmm. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Delegate Jay Walker, Chair Jay Walker. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, next is also a, a wonderful friend and and someone who is extremely extremely knowledgeable about what goes on in the General Assembly. Uh, he is chair of a very, very influential committee in the House of Economic Matters. Um, Delegate, Delegate Davis is, is someone who leads with distinction, uh, understands policy like uh, few people do, and, and we are very delighted to have him not only representing Prince George's County, uh, playing a major role in the state, uh, but also someone who cares deeply about uh, what he does and, and the impact that he is having. So I'd like to bring up Chair and Delegate uh, Derek Davis. <laughs> Did I do a good job, Chair? All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, these are our panelists. What I'd like to do, um, gentlemen, is provide you just with a few minutes on um, your role in the General Assembly, some observations you might have uh, seen in the General Assembly, um, and, uh, and then I have some questions and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Does that, does that work for you? But also I'd like to bring up, um, be before we begin, uh, this person has done a uh, remarkable, remarkable uh, job as chair of our legislative committee. I, I think, I, I think I can speak for you all. You've seen the chamber now in Annapolis much more than uh, uh, this year uh, and playing a role in being seen in Upper Marlboro. Uh, we are certainly have, have played a role in influencing policy and I, I like to bring up and I like to thank uh, Kenny Battle who is the chair of our legislative committee. I'm sure Kenny would mind that we'd be remiss to also mention Tammy Watkins, who has done a magnificent job as co-chair of PrEP, uh, prep a magnificent job of co-chairing the committee. Okay, with that, um, we'll, we'll start with uh, Chair Walker, and then we'll just go down 
Sure. Can I do a mic check first? Can you all hear me okay? Yes. It's funny. You say I work for college football, and the moment I was getting mic'd up, one of my old bosses, Kurt Simon, is in the back. So if I start talking football jargon up here, it's because my IFB is in the back, and he's telling me to speed it up. He can't hear my replay voice. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, one of our delegates, a freshman delegate, who's got a tremendous future, and it's good to have people like him on board, people that understand the business community is important in Prince George's County. He came and advocated heavily for that. He joined me on Ways and Means. Uh, Delegate Daryl Barnes is in the back joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, my role is uh, I represent the 26th District, as many of you all know. Those of you all that don't know what the 26th District is, uh, you better ask somebody, as we like to say. Uh, I'm down in southern Prince George's County, Fort Washington, Oxon Hill, Temple Hills, Clinton area, Akakeek, and a little place called National Harbor that I'm sure this room is familiar with. Uh, that's my delegate role, but also as chair of the Prince George's County delegation, I felt that going into Annapolis, it was my job to make sure that Governor Hogan understood that the things we ask for in Prince George's County, they're not just good for Prince George's County, they're not just good for the 26th district, they're good for the state of Maryland as a whole. I'm sure this group will understand, anytime you're trying to grow your business infrastructure, transportation goals are crucial. So when we're talking about connecting the Purple Line, the Purple Line is for the business community so people can get back and forth to work. That's not just good for Prince George's County, that's good for the state of Maryland as a whole. Uh, education funding, having your second largest education system on the bottom of the state rankings is not good for the state of Maryland. There's no way you can slice and dice it whatever you want to. So when you talk about education, which I'm sure you're going to hear from myself and from Senator Peters, from Delegate Davis, uh, that's been the key. It really does start that. And I think even to the local level, you heard from our county executive, Attorney Baker, uh, the importance of placing an educational system at the forefront. Because if you all know, as a business community, if you all don't have a good situation for your employees well, and, and employers as well to live and to educate their children and have a good quality of life, then it's all for now. And so I think we have to make a concerted effort to make sure that we bring the business community in the mix when we talk about improving our educational system in Prince George's County. I will say uh, the good news to report is there were no new taxes out of Annapolis. Uh, you in this room, as well as myself personally and everybody up here, felt we were taxed out a little bit. And so I think the key was how do we have a structural deficit shrink and not pass it on to the business community or to the individual community. And that was one of the keys. I think in the coming years, you'll start to hear uh, more. I chair the taxation committee uh, in the state house in the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, there are a lot of bills talking about the business personal property tax. I think that this year was the year that we could tackle that because we have so many questions out there, particularly with education funding. But uh, I do anticipate being a large uh, business property tax, uh, personal property tax package coming in the coming a uh, year in the next session. Uh, the Speaker of the House has told me to get a grip on that. Let's look at all the different uh, formulas and models we can use. A number of local jurisdictions have already been very proactive in trying to lower that, and I think that's something you'll hear uh, from us down the road. With that being said, I don't want to uh, run my mouth too much, and I want to pass it on to the next speaker. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Chair Peters? I don't think my mic's on. Do you have a mic? No, I don't. <laughs> You said on up. purpose to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. See how we work. Right. See how we work together so well. <laughs> That's why Jay's over there. <laughs> Jay's got his own game going over there. You know. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, first good morning. of all, let me introduce a couple people. I have uh, in the house here, we have uh, Cheryl Landis, who's the chair of our Democratic Central Committee. So, we have uh, my school board member, Gina Jacobs, who's over there hiding in the corner. Um, Dave, thanks for you and Donna putting this together. I was here last year, and it's a little bit more fireworks last year because we had President Miller here. And, um, just, you know, I have a theory about him. You know, I I'm, I'm work well with him. <clears throat> But you know, you want to be the planet Earth. You want to be the third planet out. Because if you're Mercury, if you're too close to him. <laughs> but if you're in Pluto, you know, he doesn't like to talk to you. So I try to be planet Earth. But he, he's a, a great champion for our county, a great champion for our state. And he's really kind of set the tone when we had a new governor. Um, you know, Governor Hogan came in. And I think if I had to use one word for this session in the last few months, it's uncertainty. 
that's where we are. We had a, a Democratic governor for quite some time. We kind of all agreed, here's where we're going with the Thornton money, with uh, giving pay raises to state employees, et cetera. And to this date, right now, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And I hope we can clear that up for you today, because I know there's a lot of money hanging in the balance for our county and for our state. But I've really enjoyed working uh, with Delegate Barnes, Delegate Walker, Delegate Davis. The key for us when we go up to Annapolis is to be united. If we are divided, there's 23 other jurisdictions that will be happy to take the money that we need for our projects. So we worked well together. We got almost all of our delegation bills out. We fought together for education. You know, we're the number one um, receiver of money from the state, over a billion dollars. It, it makes a big difference for our school system. So proud to work with you guys and look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Chair Davis. Good morning, everybody. All right, we can do it that way, too. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Um, uh, Senator Harrington, as, as I still like to call him, he, he asked us to state what our role is and some observations from Annapolis. Um, my role, I have many roles like everyone else in Annapolis, but I would say besides being uh, Prince George's County advocate, cheerleader, and so forth, my primary role is to serve as the chairman of the House Economic Matters Committee. That committee has oversight over a number of issues, insurance, uh, or workers, insurance, uh, property and casualty, um, science and technology, uh, businesses, professional licenses, alcohol, beverages, banking, uh, and I can go on. Uh, there have been a number of things that we have taken a look at over the last couple of years to improve Maryland's business climate. Uh, um, the last, during the last interim, uh, 2014, I was appointed to what's known, I'm sure many of you have probably heard by now, the Augustine Commission, named after uh, Norm Augustine, the retired chairman of Lockheed Martin. And so we, we had, oh, I don't know, probably eight to 10 meetings from around the state, from Hagerstown to Southern Maryland to uh, uh, Rockville. We were, we were all over the place hearing the community, listening to the business community, its, its concerns, and the things uh, you all felt we needed to do to change in Maryland um, to compete. And without rehashing all of that, we have a, a very extensive report on, on what we've heard and what we, um, what we needed to do. There were a few recommendations came up. There were several recommendations that came out of that that resulted in, I believe, five bills that we initiated this past session. Uh, one of the bills is that we put forward that passed and, and that's awaiting the governor's signature is a council that's gonna be created to review regulations that are, I guess, being imposed by, by the state and its impact on, on businesses. We've heard uh, much from the business community about how onerous regulations can be, how difficult it can be to do business in Maryland and its counties. So we, we put forth legislation creating that council that will review those regulations. We also um, have a bill that's coming forward that deals with, uh, we got this from higher ed. Um, there are very stringent laws, ethics laws, and, and procurement requirements that make it very difficult for them to operate and, and, and to put forth ideas that they create from a technology standpoint and then to put that out into the market. So we, we've, um, we're addressing that issue as well. There's also a pilot program that actually begins in sometime in 2016. I want to say the summer of 2016, but it's next year. It's for high school students, and they will get a skills certificate um, upon completion of the program. As many of you know, um, or we push, we try to push our children towards college as we should, but that may not be for everybody. That may not be the best course for them. Um, and there are a dearth of, um, at least as we were told, of, of uh, other skills that are needed in the business community uh, as well to, to make us, um, to help us to flourish. So we, we've established that program um, at their behest. It's a pilot program. It's going to last two years, as I said, and they will get a skills certificate going forward. We're also creating um, a customer service business ombudsman position that will what we've heard also is that oftentimes dealing with the state 
it seems that the employees are more interested in punishing or, or, or smacking uh, a company around, if you, if you will, for getting something wrong, as opposed to helping them get through the process. If they make a mistake, um, instead of trying to find them, tell them what they need to do to correct those mistakes and make all, but more than that, let them know what's available, what type of services uh, are available in the state, how it can be of assistance to them, how they can use the process to their advantage. So those are some of the things, some of the bills we put forward. That was uh, a very bipartisan effort um, that we did. Uh, when, when the bills came forward, the governor, as well as the presiding officers, all testified in support of it. Uh, I'll close with just the observation. I'm sure you all have read the, the postmortem from Monday night, our final day of session, and, um, and, and some of the uh, uh, shenanigans that I guess you may want to call it that went on. I would just say um, I wouldn't be too alarmed by that. I, we all want the same things. We want good schools, safe communities, jobs for everyone who's looking for them. But we have very different ideas about how to get there. Um, the people of Maryland chose a divided government last November. And so you're going to have these kinds of dust-ups as we figure our way through. But ultimately, we all have the citizens of Maryland at heart, and we will get there, and we will make, uh, we'll make it better than it was when we were elected, hopefully, when we were elected last year. So when you review our, our terms <coughs> thereof, hopefully you'll be able to say job well done. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Davis. I believe now the staff was passing around a, a few cards on tables, and uh, so I'll open up with questions, um, and then um, you know, we'll open up to the audience. The cards will be passed to me, and I'll read the cards from here. Before I do that, I want to recognize my good friend, Todd Turner, uh, who's on the County Council of Prince George's County. So, Todd. Todd, is this your district? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell anybody you said that. I uh, know, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I like, we, we did, uh, all of you seem to open up with school funding, and I think there's, there's some fuzziness about where we are with school funding. Uh, the, the, um, the governor looked like the budget was going well, it was passed very early, and then there was this thing called the supplemental budget that came down that seemed to put um, you know, some uncertainty in the whole process, particularly as it relates to school funding. So can you tell us about what was ultimately passed in the supplemental budget, uh, and then what is the amount, if, if there's some increases for county schools, wh where is that money, but, and what role does the governor play in releasing that money? So any, any one of you? Okay, all I'll you start off, David. Um, Again, I started off with the word uncertainty, and that's where we are right now, with some of the school budget. Right now, everything that was done in the Thornton Commission is fine. It's fine, because we passed the budget. What's at risk is what's called GCEI, which is $68 million, of which Prince George's gets $20 million of that. The governor can either fund that, not fund it, partially funded. When we first came in session, he, he went at 50%. The House passed a budget that funded it 100%. He came back and said, how about 75%? We said, no, we want 100%. We passed the budget. So again, you know, he could, we could lose $20 million if he does not put down what we call a supplemental. The governor puts down multiple supplementals which fund these projects. Uh, or, or, or line items. So that is at risk. $20 million for our school system is at risk right now. Um, in terms of the, uh, the capital budget, um, I think we got the $280 million for um, school construction. Um, the three of us, um, as well as Delegate Barnes, worked hard, and I know some, sometimes it's controversial, I'm not looking at you, Gina, but don't look away. You know, we, we feel that, that our schools should have quality uh, resources, and, and one of those things is, is turf fields, you know. Um, we're the only county that doesn't have turf fields. We don't have a girls lacrosse, we don't have girls field hockey, we don't have boys lacrosse. Every county around us has it, and these kids are getting a lot of scholarships. I know Jay and 
Jay and uh, Jay's daughter, my daughter, play lacrosse. These kids are getting scholarships. We're getting overlooked for scholarships. We get some of the best athletes in the state because we don't have the fields. We can barely keep the fields up for for uh, football. Jay, you can pipe in here because that's your area. But it's it's embarrassing to be honest with you. So we've got another 2.8 sitting out there at risk for our fields. Um, the, specifically, that's kind of the education piece. Um, and we can talk about the hospital also later. Right. I, I think I, uh, what I would add was going into the session, uh, we got the first the first indication we had from Governor Hogan, you know, without having a conversation, was what he puts on paper. And that was his budget, his initial budget. Uh, it cost Prince George's County alone probably it was $78 million. So we talked about the GCI. He wanted to change some of the funding formulas. Uh, the GCI basically means that it costs a little bit more to educate a kid in Prince George's County, Montgomery County, than it may cost uh, in Cecil County or Hartford County, some of those areas where the cost of living isn't so high. Uh, we were able to keep the cap, uh, eliminate the cap. He wanted to cap our education funding. And what you'll hear him say is, and then, you know, I don't believe in throwing rocks at the politicians, but your actions speak louder than your words. And you'll hear him say, well, I've spent more money on public education than any other governor. Well, had he not been in office and had he not cut the budget, there would have been even more money spent. And most of that money would have come to Prince George's County. So what we're trying to say is put the funding back in place, which we had already agreed upon, which was budgeted, which is going to help our school system out. Uh, he chose to, in what we call the supplemental, which he has some leeway to govern the state, he can choose his priorities to cut some of the education funding that, and I'm going to say, before I even got in office, or probably before Senator Peters, that our predecessors had put in place. Derek Davis has been there for a long time, so uh, <laughs> he was probably <laughs> going to do it, but uh, I always give credit to our predecessors to the amount of education funding we bring back to Prince George's County. If we had to try and get that type of funding formula passed today, it wouldn't pass. So it's our job to keep that education level of funding in place. So when they talk about playing with education formula, uh, as a united front, we got together and put up a, a good fight to at least do the best we could. Now it's up to the governor with his supplemental to free up this extra $20 million. Chair Walker, you talked about both uh, um, Senator Peters, you talked about the GCI. What is the acronym stands for? Geographic Cost of Educational Index. So, we can, and, and you explained it very well, thanks. Um, and so right now, according to both of you, some of the education funding, the GCI, and also some of the other funding is in limbo right now, even though the supplement, the, the governor has the discretion to release that. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, the, the, the remainder of it, he proposed the 50%, uh, we need 100%. So when you look at the, the cap, was really going to cost us a, a lot of money. That was a $37 million range. And the GCI piece that we had floating out there, because we're one of the largest communities and When the Democrats were in charge of the U.S. Senate, now she's not. So we think that money's still there, but of course that's uncertain as well. Um, I do think our delegation will come through, but we have to match it. So he is going to make the call. The governor's going to make the call. And the way we kind of leverage this, since we don't have that much uh, authority in that area, because again, he creates the funding, is that we peppered the new Secretary of Transportation. I mean, we, the, 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 in this case, the Senate does the confirmations of the secretaries, and that was about an hour conversation, because we've got Montgomery and Prince George's to benefit from the Purple Line, and we wanted to know, you know, is he going to fund it or is he not? What's his opinion on it? Has he done other projects like this? So again, this is up to the governor, and we'll know probably in the next 30 days whether he's going to move forward with this project. Um, again, I'd say it's I'd say it's 50-50. To be honest with you. Any other responses? I think a little bit more. I, I would hope so. You know, if you know Governor Hogan's background, as I mentioned before, uh, transportation initiatives are key to businessmen. Uh, every time there's a, anything dealing with uh, road improvements and infrastructure, uh, we're always getting letters from the business community supporting the project. Uh, and I think it, it almost becomes simple if, uh, if we don't do it, there's $900, $900 billion from the federal government that's going to be spent somewhere. If we don't spend on the Purple Line, they're going to be building bridges down in Mississippi someplace or Alabama. So we need to really take advantage of this money. And, and I will say, uh, one of the votes that we had, uh, and we didn't get a lot of pressure from it, there was a proposal to uh, roll back the, the consumer price index on the gas tax that we passed a couple years ago. And had we done that, then we would have uh, capped about $1.5 billion that we just would have lost 
And I think uh, there wasn't a lot of pressure on us to do that. Uh, when it comes to some of the, I was telling some of the freshman delegates, hey, the tough vote on the gas tax was, was a year ago. When we passed it, the gas was at $3.85 a gallon. And move forward uh, 12 months later, now we're at $2 and, or, or $2.75, $2.80, those were the glory days. But there's no point really revisiting that now because we still have so many projects that need to be funded. Uh, direct correlation, I know Chairman Davis has his. Uh, you know, we were able to secure $135 million of funding for uh, Indian Head Highway down my way because of the gas tax. Did you guys feel it at the wallet? Price of gas went down. Did you all call us and tell us thank you? <laughs> so, but we're still getting bridges done and getting the exchange over in Suitland done. So uh, as we talk about, there's only so much money. We try and prioritize what's best. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Sometimes that's, that's not mentioned in the conversation around education are our colleges, particularly our community college. Uh, the community college does a lot with job training, um, with workforce development, uh, innovation, and economic growth. And so I wanted to speak to how do we, you know, if, if we're looking to, as we look at providing funding for our public schools, how then we can strengthen then the funding for our community colleges. Did Dr. Dukes submit this question? Because so she's more than welcome to come up and answer, the, uh, answer her own question. So she probably knows the answer to it. I would say there are no names on these. <laughs> check, check the penmanship. Is it real? Uh, 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 I, I think that when you, when you look at you know, education as a whole, uh, I'm on ways and means we 
Maryland education policy for the state of Maryland, uh, there's been a huge increase on the focus of the community colleges. I, I would say that. Uh, in Prince George's County, we have a fine representative, and, and Dr. Dukes does a good job of speaking well. Anytime we're talking about uh, community college programs, uh, then we're at the forefront of it. I think the, the two most effective are, have to be uh, Baltimore City, uh, Prince George's, and then uh, Arona County. Uh, Arona County does a good job. Uh, what we try to do is realize you know, we have a, a mandate that we want everybody in the state of Maryland to have a higher education, but we also realize that not everybody's gonna go to the University of Maryland, not everybody's gonna go to Salisbury. So the question we're always asking is, if we're putting this uh, infrastructure in place so where every kid is college ready, well, what about those kids that aren't gonna go to a four year and those that quite simply, to be honest, can't afford to go to a four year, that have to have a two year plan in place. So that's why we're always fighting for increased funding uh, for the community colleges. They have a co-op, I like to call it, between the community college and I'm still trying to figure out where uh, Prince George's community college took a little hit this year, but it wasn't their turn to necessarily get the bulk majority of the money as it is in other years. So uh, is I somewhere correct in that, Dr. Dukes? Okay, so, so, and so uh, once it comes time for Prince George County, and, and they work effectively together with it. So uh, we support it. We want all the different programs. Uh, I know that I was big, and it was good to know that uh, two years ago, the state was making a big push on uh, cybersecurity and the cybersecurity programs. And so it sounds great. These are jobs that come out producing $70,000 a year jobs. There's a shortage of workers. And I'm like, wow, I've got this great idea. I'm going to take this to Dr. Dukes. And Dr. Dukes says, we already have that, Jay. So it makes me feel good. So we'll continue that focus in that relationship. Sure. Um, Annapolis and funding of schools is all about formulas. We're all locked into these formulas. So University of Maryland is the big dog in the public education system. And they get a certain percentage, and it goes down to all the community colleges. That's how it works. The idea there was because they want, didn't want 24 community colleges, or however many, 24, competing against each other. The 13 Maryland system colleges competing against each other. Hopkins competing. All of a sudden, we've got all these people fighting for dollars. And again, I talk about the discretionary dollars and decisions we have to make. So they created a formula. And so it's a trickle-down effect with the community colleges. And the community college all come together, and they work out not just with their operating, but with their capital dollars what they get. So the key is to just overall fund more education and it will, and it will come down to the community colleges. But I, I do want to say we have one of the best community college systems in the United States. Um, and the way they partnered with Maryland, you can go to you know community college for two years and then get into any Maryland school you want. And I, I get a lot of kids that call me and you know, I have a 3.5 and I scored in the 70 percentile on the SAT and I didn't get into Maryland. And I said, hey, you know what? Go to the community college for two years and you, you can automatically transfer if you have over a, a 2.0. And, you know, and that's how it works sometimes. Some of the kids can't get in because it's too competitive, but you've brought some great kids in and, and up through um, the system. And, and I would, uh, just a brief editorial by May, I, I, I would say that Community college can play a major, major role in economic development with, with many of the, the capital projects that are happening in, on the college, with some of the trainings that are happening and building of capacity with businesses there. If we can central, if we will create a, a central workforce development piece as, as, as well as a capacity building piece at the college, then that could, you know, perhaps more monies can go to the college, not just for um, your know, educational resources, but economic can I, and I'm not hired by the college, by the way. <laughs> can, I, can I add this? this is, it's kind of off topic, but it was probably the, the best bill I thought we passed in Annapolis. Uh, and, and there was a bill presented that talked about human trafficking. You say, how are you talking about human trafficking in community college? Well, there was a bill that said, let's suppose you have a, a young lady who's been human trafficked. And we know what that's the word for. And they're here in Prince George's County. It's a bad thing that happened to this young lady. Well, she escapes, gets her life together, and wants to get an education. Well, are we doing the best thing by having to go to Prince George Community College, where maybe she runs into somebody that she knows from the past she's trying to escape from? Or is she better off going to Cecil Community College over in the western part of Maryland? So the reason why I talk about this was 
we said, well, why don't we give her a waiver for paying out-of-county fees? So if somebody had this bad incident happen to them in Cecil County, and they want to get away from Cecil County and get a fresh start on life, well, why do they have to pay out-of-county fees to go to Prince George's Community College? It's bills like that where you feel like you're making a difference. So talking about the community college and, and the community college association really stepped up and said we're willing to waive the out-of-county fees for these documented cases. And those are the, the things that we Can take votes on that make you feel good about. And I guess to further expound upon oh, yeah. that as it relates to the importance that the community college is taking on. Also, it was, it was mentioned earlier that just the rising cost of college now and the affordability of it for some, it's just out of reach to go to a four-year university. You go the first two years, as Senator Peters noted, you, you, you get that associates, and then you transfer on, and then you only have to pay for the last two years. Now, I also have to give the community college and the Board of Education credit. They have a program um, where if you, you can start earning college credit while you're, in, while you're in high school. You have to maintain a certain GPA and, and, and other, other um, standards, but if you do that, while you're in college, you can start earning, uh, while you're in high school, you can start earning college credits at, I believe, no cost to the, um, no, no cost to the students, as long as they maintain, um, you know, the, the GPA and, and going forward. So I think that's one point, gets them a head start on what to expect, um, and, and, and that's just, that's going to be, I think, the wave of the, at least the near future. You know, we've talked about Delegate Davis, if you could, Chair Davis, if you could, you know, uh, take on this question, I think. Um, we've talked a lot about public-private partnerships, and, and one of the sort of public side is with community uh, legacy money out of uh, DHCD that provides for, you know, business development for local municipalities and counties. Can you speak to where that is, that, or even if that still exists? Um, at this point in time, I can't tell you exactly where it exists. That, that's been an um, a idea program that, that's being discussed. But again, it, you know, when we talk revenue enhancements, i.e. taxes and, and so forth, these are the things we're not, as I like to tell folks, we're, we're not, when we're seeking money, we have these kinds of difficult decisions to make. We're, we're not building decks on, on, on our house building or anything like that. These are very real dollars that we constantly um, have to make decisions about, whether we're talking about uh, the community college, the, uh, this particular program, or some of the others. The, 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 the revenues are not coming in at the way they once were. Yeah, Jay, I have been around a long time. I do remember surpluses. You were probably still at Howard when this was, when this was going on. Don't, don't feed into that. <laughs> But it's okay, he couldn't get into Maryland, so. <laughs> oh. I said it. Chair <laughs> Walker, I'm with you. Hey, Maryland's lost, Maryland's lost. I'm <laughs> with you. Uh, but no, uh, it, it, it's, it's a funding issue. We are, um, I, know, I know that that's one of many programs that are being reevaluated, reviewed to see what we can get done, what we're able to do with it, but it's just a financing issue. Okay. We're running short on time, and. Um, I wanted to ask just a few other questions. One of the things that's occurring, I think that's very interesting, and I know that, uh, for example, Craig Buckle is very involved in, is looking at you know, food policy in general, food movement. Um, and it seems that, that there's lots of interest in urban farming, and lots of interest in cultivating, and, uh, cultivating farming, um, and cultivating farming groups. Um, um, and so, do you see the state engaging in that as well as expanding the sort of food equity throughout the state in a way where we could provide healthier food to neighborhoods that are particularly, you know, considered in food deserts that have little access to grocery stores? Do you see the connection with the state playing a role in, in elevating that? Yeah, I think it all starts local because the local government has the ability to identify what we call food deserts. Uh, Baltimore City uh, had a local bill to give tax credit to their food desert. Uh, we passed that bill. They must get approved for it. I think it's a good idea. Uh, you know, the food desert means if you're in urban areas and you don't have a lot of grocery stores, where are folks going to buy uh, vegetables from uh, instead of fast food? So uh, I like what Baltimore City did. I think the local government, our county council, I know uh, Councilman Turner's here, if they identify these food deserts, 
then I think it makes sense to provide them some type of tax credit because what they're really doing is they're helping us out in areas, particularly with our county executives in the TNI uh, areas that we have throughout the county. We're trying to transform the neighborhood. Those areas there, I think the supermarkets and the grocery chains are doing us a favor when they go in there. So we need to give them some incentive to go and add more uh, accommodations. And if, if I can just sort of oh, add sure. on that, um, for me, I, I think we're, we're blessed here in Prince George's County. I didn't realize to the extent the problem is until I started speaking with our colleagues in Baltimore City. And so this isn't just a feel-good kind of thing when you're talking about food deserts. Many of the kids, and, and the adults for that matter, they may go into a, a Wawa, for example, and, and, and they're making meals off, off the food that they're selling. And so when you talk about childhood obesity and other health-related issues, it stems from uh, situations such as this. They're not able to get fresh vegetables and, and, and the things that we need for well-balanced diet to be healthy. They're making meals off of food that they should not be eating or should be eating very sparingly. For many of, uh, of these residents, and certainly the kids, it's a, it's a lifestyle. And so when we start wondering why our children are, are, are so big at such a young age and why they're so unhealthy at a young age, it's not just because they aren't out you know, playing ball and playing PlayStation. It's the things that they're eating. So, I, I mean, I don't want to be redundant, but it is very important. And I didn't realize just how extensive the problem was until I started speaking to some of my colleagues from around the state. Let me, let me uh, just say you were a leader, David, when we were in the Senate on this issue. We appreciate the issues with the sugar intake with the kids, the obesity, and uh, we've tried to continue your good work. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Chair Peters, uh, there's a question here about uh, can you speak to the NTI and what percentage Prince George's Board of Education received is it still being phased in? Could you describe what NTI is? NTI is net taxable income. It was a bill that we put in a couple years ago to even out the playing field. Um, what happens is that uh, normally today is a big day. It's tax day. You've got to send your taxes and you need to. I haven't sent mine in yet, Jay. <laughs> but but um, what happens is in the, there is a, um, the math is done on what people send their taxes in on April 15th. Well, a lot of the wealthy delay their taxes for six months and send them in later. You okay? said you haven't have paid the taxes yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've paid them yet. I don't work for ESPN. <laughs> Small business owner. No, 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 were you a former quarterback either. <laughs> so anyway, um, so the calculation was done and the, the money was distributed based on April 15th returns. Well, Baltimore County and Montgomery County, two of our wealthiest jurisdictions, a lot of those individuals pay their taxes in six months. So we were losing you know, $10, 15000000 million because of that equation. We weren't getting that money. So it was a big fight with Montgomery County, I can tell you that right now, because they were getting a certain allocation, and because it would have to be recalculated in September, they would get less. So we fought them for years on this issue. Then the state stepped in and said, we'll make up the difference where Montgomery County would lose that. So we finally got that passed. Well, it is discretionary at the governor, okay? He doesn't have to fund it. So we've had a couple bills in from the last couple years to mandate it. Uh, those bills never passed. So we didn't get it this year, and we're not going to get it this year, because in our budget, it's not in there. The governor deferred it a year, and we decided to fight for what we call the foundation base money, which we did. It's another $68 million that we put in the school system's budget, um, and fight for GCEI. But it has been deferred till next year. So we're not going to get that additional money that we thought we were going to get um, for that. And let me let me just expound for one second. No, because I was going to ask you also, you mentioned the hospital. Yeah. You could briefly talk about that, but go ahead. Well, well, let me just say this. We were in the best of all worlds this year, according to the budget. Our, our um, school population went up, and our wealth base went down. So we were expected to get the most money of any jurisdiction. 
But then the governor passed down a budget that kind of gave us a haircut on that. So, you know, we, we didn't get the NTI, the GCEI is at risk, and we also took a haircut on, you know, our, our budget because of the funding. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge, so. Um, and I, I try to be realistic about it. You know, I, I, again, hopefully the GCI will come down, we'll get another $20 million, but um, we're not gonna get the NTI this year. Did you want to speak briefly about the hospital? You sure. That um, so every year we get, the, the state uh, puts $15 million in the operating budget for the hospital, and the county matches that. Well, this year, we put the $15 million in, and that is completely discretionary. Again, I, I'm going to use a, a little name here, Section 48. I have it with me. This is Section 48 of the budget. There's about $80 million worth of possible things he can or can't fund. $15 million of that is the money in the hospital. Okay, So that's uncertain. The $30 million for the capital. You know, the state made a commitment for $200 million, Maryland gives $200, um, and the county gives $200. Well, that's in a different budget. That's in the capital budget. The governor has a line item veto authority in the capital budget. Okay? So he could take that $30 million out. So it's, it's it, this, again, it's, it's, it's very up in the air right now. Um, we really, again, I hope he doesn't do that. I hope he doesn't. Um, you know, take the 15 million from the hospital. But um, we took some action at the end of session to kind of send a message, and we mandated GCEI for, you know, the out years. He wasn't happy about that. In fact, you know, on the Senate side of the budget, we got a unanimous support for the budget, which hasn't happened in a long time. But once we passed that GCEI and mandated it, because he was not sure whether he was going to do it, we lost all the Republican votes on the side when the budget came back from the House. So can we do that in the future? Yeah, we can mandate a lot of things. We don't want to do it, uh, but we hope he comes to terms and, and funds the hospital, the capital, $30 million. We've worked hard in the $15 million we, uh, we put in for operating. No, so I think what you're hearing is, is very uh, telling that uh, the, the budget confrontation that all of you are having is around that. Uh, fairness and equity formulas that that the governor may or may not agree with, certainly that you all are advocating for. But what that means is that the governor is in a very uh, leveraged position of putting that in areas where you know, he can veto that, and then other projects get delayed as well. So I want to really appreciate the work that you're doing because it takes a heck of a lot of advocacy and also homework to, to put forth the kind of positions that begins to bring money to Prince George's County. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I'm sorry that I couldn't get to uh, all the questions. Um, I, I know there is interest around the um, county executive's tax proposal. Uh, I would invite you to, uh, I believe he's having a state of the uh, economy address tomorrow, and I would invite you to ask that question to him. Also, to be somewhat narcissistic, but I thought humorous, um, I don't know who wrote this question, um, but how can Mr. Harrington look so thin despite his wife owning the world's best baby? <laughs> I, I had nothing to do with that question. It sounds like a plug, baby. <laughs> what was but the name of the bakery again? It's called Shortcake Bakery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, I'm being asked these questions, I want you to know. Uh, it's 4,700 <laughs> In Hyattsville, in Hyattsville, Maryland. Um, but God bless you if you think I'm thin. I mean, really. Um, anyway, thank you for, for everything that you all do. I want to also, before I turn it over to uh, Kenny Battle, I want to acknowledge the tremendous work of our committee chairs. Uh, Tanya Jackson, I see it's here, who's chair of our health committee. Tanya, would you please stand? I want you, I want you to stay tuned because I tell you, she is putting in sweat, blood, energy into this health summit. And I know it's going to be very successful. So, Tanya, thank you for your leadership. It's going to be a health summit that's not only 
um, looking at how we can improve health in, in our area and in our region, but how the business community can benefit from these health discussions. So Tanya, thank you for your work on that. And then we have um, Craig Buckle, who uh, is chair of our Sports, Hospitality, and Entertainment Committee. Craig, you would stand. And also we recognize right now that committee is working very, very hard on our golf tournament, which is in May. And certainly you, you'll be receiving a save the date today uh, about that. Please take advantage of that because that gives scholarship money to our community college and uh, Dr. Duke. So, Craig, thank you for your leadership. And that, and Jim Henderson, International Committee, thank you. Oh, he's gone. Okay, so Jim. Cheryl Landis, who's chair of our Education Committee. Cheryl, <laughs> and we are really working together on how to unbundle even some of the major contracts that are in the education system to help them benefit uh, small businesses. So Cheryl, thank you for your leadership in that. Kyle Bayless and our Small and Minority Business Committee. Kyle Paxton, we had a meeting. I just wanted to Oh, you did you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I particularly wanted to say that to my friend, uh, you know, uh, Celeste James, who saw me when I was not so trim. Um, but no, thank you. Kaiser Permanente is doing a great job in looking at community health. So thank you, Kaiser, because they've been a major influence in how to change my own habits. So I want to to the so thank you, Kyle. And Kyle's uh, meetings are outstanding, and uh, they packed the room, and we're going to continue to do that. And I want to recognize also uh, Tom Farrisey, who is chair of our economic development. And Tom, thank you. Tom is a major advocate of the Purple Line uh, and how that can help you know build business. Um, I want to recognize, if I can't tell you one more person, I'll bring you up. We have an incredible relationship with Junior Achievement, and Junior Achievement is building a finance park here in Prince George's County to help financial literacy with our young people. And here today is the President and CEO of Junior Achievement, Ed Munir, and I just wanted to recognize him. <laughs> Kenny, if you would come, I don't know if you might, but if you would come up and then talk about the legislation. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning, so let's do this. Listen, uh, leaders get faced with uh, hard questions from time to time. Mine this morning was, how do you take a microphone away from the chairman uh, on the stage? So you see, I, my, my answer was, you don't. And uh, I was a seat filler up here this morning. Uh, but um, you definitely don't take it away when you're part of the, an organization that's hosting this. And so uh, I want to thank our guests for all of the uh, Wisdom and all of the uh, uh, you know hard work that you do in Annapolis. So let's give our yeah, yeah. Uh, this is top notch. I'll say you know we get around, we go to community summits, and you all uh, did a fantastic job with the microphones and having this thing the way it is set up for Q and A. I think it's the top notch performance in a uh, show, I should say. I do have two last little things I'm gonna say. Uh, one, I have to give credit. Uh, I have to thank my treasurer of my campaign account. He's a member of the chamber, Jerome Smallwood. Thank you, Jerome, for all you do for my campaign. And for the last one I'll make, I don't need to take over, but this is the microphone, right? And you got cameras there, right? I get paid to run my mouth on TV, so I'm, I'm looking for this song. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, see what I mean? <laughs> just turn it loose, man. Just turn it loose. But, um, uh, so, what I want to do before I start talking about my role as the, uh, Chair of the Legislative Committee is to acknowledge again my co-chair who worked so hard, Tammy Watkins. And David, David boosts me up here to, to take a lot of the credit. But uh, really what we do is try to keep track of what's going on in Annapolis uh, and in Upper Marlboro. And I think we had uh, as much, uh, we had our hands full in Upper Marlboro as well as, as if Councilman Turner is here as he can attest to. He actually called me up to a couple of microphones that I wasn't prepared for there either. But um, no, we um, try to do our best to uh, make sure that policies uh, that are proposed in Annapolis and in Upper Marlboro are brought to the attention of our members. And we uh, try to do our best to try to, to have the interaction so that we can understand uh, what the impacts will be and to uh, step in and, and provide advocacy where uh, necessary. 
Now, since I'm speaking at the end of a program after legislators, I know I'm supposed to keep it brief. Um, so I will say this. Um, I was honored, David, by the opportunity to do this, uh, as well as um, by my predecessor, Miss uh, Octavia Caldwell. So I try to uh, give you know credit to her whenever uh, possible. Now, um, I will say this. We are really planning on taking advantage of the interim, what's called the interim uh, uh, situation now. Now the session is over. And one of the goals of the Legislative Committee is to increase our interaction with legislators so that we get to a point where we're talking about policies and proposals before you know they're presented. Uh, we really do want to uh, encourage um, our legislators. We want to be your partners. We want to talk to you about um, how you can help us you know, uh, sustain our businesses and grow. And we want to be able to help you, you know, in the ways that we can. And I'm sure you don't, you don't waste time letting us know how we can help you. So we uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with you. And uh, we look forward to strengthening those relationships as we uh, head forward. And all those remarks go also to the county council. So, Mr. Turner, I'll be, I'll be talking to you later on this week anyway. So thank you, sir.